COVID is one of the major downsides for uh, uh, Africa's recovery prospects uh, going into the new year. Um, Omicron, I think, is really, really hits home that um, uh, of the urgent need for uh, global vaccine equity, right? We're talking about a region where um, uh, with the lowest global vaccination rate, uh, with just 10% of the population um, fully or partially vaccinated. Welcome and thank you for joining today's edition of Taneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajiwara, co-president of Taneo Political Risk Advisory in New York City. Well, a week ago, unless you had taken Greek, nobody really knew what the word Omicron meant. Well, we all do now. Um, and while we don't know what the severity of this new variant is going to be, what it does tell us is that this is going to carry into a third year um, as we head into, into 2022. What else we know is coming? U.S. midterm elections later in the fall um, as we transition from the sort of legislative phase of the Biden administration into the more regulatory phase. We know that there are inflation concerns out there. The Fed chair, Jerome Powell, talking about ending the taper early and perhaps spooking markets by suggesting that uh, rates might, uh, might increase earlier than had originally uh, been expected. We will continue to struggle with the return to work issues. Um, the fallout from the climate change conference, COP26, will continue to play out into 2022. And we've got some other major events, the Olympic Games in Beijing and, of course, the World Cup Qatar 2022. So today um, we are joined by colleagues of mine from Taneo Political Risk Advisory to look at the world ahead in 2022, what they're expecting in the various regions around the world. Uh, and what we need to be thinking about. On a subsequent call, we will be looking at what we expect uh, specifically for, for the United States. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through the introductions. All of the bios of my colleagues are available on the Taneo.com website, but let's jump right into it. And I wanna start with China. Gabe Wildow is with us. He's our lead China analyst in the United States. Um, there is a People's Congress later fall 2022, Gabe. Um, we expect the big headline news of that will be that Xi Jinping secures his third presidential term. But tell us about the significance of this, what you expect from that, what you expect leading up to it, and what we, what we sort of know about Xi Jinping's position in China right now. Thanks, Kevin. So this is a very important political year coming up in China. There's not much mystery about the basic outcome of the Party Congress, which is likely to occur in November. 2022, it, Xi Jinping is virtually certain to secure a third term as general secretary. On the other hand, we did see from the recent sixth plenum uh, last month in China, the, the Communist Party Central Committee's big yearly meeting, that there appear still to be very significant or significant, let's say, constraints on Xi Jinping's power within the party, both to shape uh, internal party dynamics and, and personnel appointments and party rules, as well as to impose big, sweeping, controversial policy change on the country. And so uh, that's an important thing uh, to keep in mind as we look at the kind of the policy outlook in China for 2022, because uh, the economy, the policy is at a crossroads in terms of the economy. The economy is slowing and uh, traditionally, what we've seen is leading into big political transition years, party congress years, uh, stimulus ramps up to ensure a positive economic background uh, and context for the, the current general secretary's attempts to consolidate his power, to appoint his uh, allies in key positions, and to achieve his other political goals. And so this, this places uh, policy makers in a tough position because there's this commitment to try to, for example, uh, deal with the real estate bubble to cut China's addiction to real estate, the economy's addiction to real estate. But that's a kind of a medium to long term structural reform type goal that that uh, conflicts with the, the need for, to boost short term growth and, and therefore to boost President Xi's position heading into the Congress. So how that balance is struck and in particular, whether the current uh, controls and restrictions on the real estate market that are having a really big uh, downward impact on economic growth, whether 
the party leadership is going to have the stomach to keep those in place and therefore to keep growth at a or to, to uh, have growth be at a low level this coming year despite the political background. Um, so that that is, I think, the the big uncertainty is: how, are, are they going to go back to the old playbook of of stimulus, of short term stimulus this year, or are they going to stick to their guns on these tough housing policies despite the short term pain that that, that imposes? You know, uh, we've seen a number of trends playing out over the over recent months on on things like the technology front, um, on uh, issues surrounding listings of Chinese companies um, uh, on Western markets, particularly in uh, in in New York and the like. And all of these obviously feed into this kind of decoupling narrative. But what do you what are you seeing? What's driving that? What's what do you expect uh, going forward on on those fronts into 2022? I think the trend continues to be selective decoupling in particular industries and in particular areas, but the idea that there's going to be a broad decoupling uh, or, or disentangling of the U.S. and Chinese economies is pretty much off the table. And we've seen uh, Biden administration officials like uh, Gina Raimondo, the, the Commerce Secretary, and Catherine Tai, the Trade Representative, essentially say that explicitly, that, that they don't want decoupling, that the two economies are going to continue to be uh, selling to each other. But at the same time, we saw just uh, last over Thanksgiving, new Chinese companies added to the Commerce Department's entity list. In other words, new export controls restricting the sale of sensitive U.S. technology to Chinese companies. And so that's the kind of uneasy balance we're going to continue to see. 2022 is kind of a new, a, another year in the new normal of U.S.-China strategic competition, where on the one hand, uh, we may see uh, some modest uh, reduction in tariffs. There's signs pointing that direction in Washington. The political momentum for at least partial tariff reduction, not complete rollback, but partial reduction is building. Uh, but on the other hand, the export controls uh, continue to strengthen and China continues to double down on its attempts to reduce its dependence on U.S. technology. And they're girding for this long-term struggle. They're, they're not counting on any kind of significant easing up of those controls from Washington. So they're, they're in this long struggle to, to achieve a more, uh, 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 less dependence and more autonomy in technology. And so we're just going to see that, that, uh, that game continue to play out in, in 2022, I think, with, with uh, perhaps you know, a, a trade continues to be robust between the U.S. and China, but uh, the export controls bite in key industries. On, on foreign listings, we've, see, we've seen rules from uh, Chinese regulators requiring cybersecurity reviews ahead of any Chinese company that wants to list uh, either in New York or in Hong Kong. And I think at least in the short term, as, as uh, regulators implement those rules and as companies digest the, the impact, the, the flow of uh, U.S. Uh, listings to the U.S., which had been very strong uh, for the first part of 2020, uh, despite the threat of delisting from the U.S. side uh, because of this audit dispute uh, and U.S. regulators' insistence that the Chinese companies disclose more about their audits, despite the threat of delisting in 2024 because of that audit dispute, we saw big flows of new IPOs from China to the U.S. in the first half of, 26, of 2020, and then that cut off dramatically with the DD Global uh, uh, fiasco and the cybersecurity investigation that derailed their IPO. And looking ahead, IPOs, uh, no, no new IPOs uh, in uh, from China in the U.S. until until this cybersecurity issue gets worked out. So, so the overall theme is again sort of partial decoupling, but uh, still a, a, a deep degree of entanglement between the two economies. Now, at a strategic level, though, I mean, obviously, the, 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 there's kind of a, a one-way street between the U.S. and, and, and China, though, and leading up to the recent virtual summit between President Biden and President Xi, we saw something of a, uh, a lowering of the rhetorical temperature somewhat. But, but what do you expect um, in terms of U.S.-China relations going into 2022? As I mentioned at the top, we have both the People's Congress. We also have the, the midterm elections in the U.S., is that a reason for both sides to want to keep things stable as possible for their own domestic purposes or for nationalistic reasons, will they ratchet up the rhetoric against the, uh, the other side? How do you, how do you see the, the, the tone of the relationship going into the, uh, into the new year? Yeah, I think the midterm elections in the U.S. and the party Congress in China limit both sides' political space to compromise. 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier in Washington, the, the momentum in favor of partial tariff rollback has grown, but I would say that the political, the balance of political pressure still favors keeping most tariffs in place. And then in China, the kind of uh, compromises or concessions that Washington would like to see from Beijing are unlikely, even more unlikely in this uh, sensitive political year where, where Xi cannot be seen to be uh, bowing his head or um, making concessions to the, U the adversary, the, the U.S. And so I think we, as I referred to earlier, I think it's, it's another year in the new normal of uh, strategic competition where sniping continues. But I think that what we did see uh, at the, at the Biden-Xi summit is that both sides uh, want to sort of put a floor under relations. They want to make sure that uh, we don't spiral into outright conflict. Uh, they want to increase communication to make sure that there are no unintended incidents that escalate. Um, but neither are we headed for some kind of dramatic uh, improvement. It's a, it's a year of, of muddle through and, and continued competition, continued diplomatic sniping. The Beijing Olympics are going to uh, and the, this new, this recent Peng Shui uh, incident is focusing attention on uh, China's human rights record. The Biden administration is quite determined to to talk tough on that and to and to impose sanctions in that area. And so uh, it's it's another year of uh, tensions on the one hand, combined with again a robust trading and investment relationship that continues. And finally, and very quickly, I just want to ask, you know, as we head into year three of, uh, of COVID, I mean, China uh, has taken essentially a, a, a zero case objective um, policy. Um, and we've, we've seen the dramatic measures that they, uh, that they will take to, to try to achieve that. Now they seem to be about the only country in the world that's doing that. Most of the rest of the world is sort of moving from a pandemic phase to an endemic um, policy phase. Um, do you see that they will continue um, to try to, to, to pursue this, this policy? I mean, most obviously, Xi Jinping himself has not left the country in two years, but this has got to be having an impact on a lot of business relationships that have counted on person-to-person -person exchanges over the years and so on and so forth. Are they going to try to continue this? The current signs are that they will. The zero tolerance policy has come in for a lot of criticism in, in, in foreign media, but it's very popular uh, among the Chinese public, and uh, th they uh, there are inconveniences, as you referred to, but uh, there was just a study uh, from the Chinese CDC indicating that uh, if they lift travel restrictions, they could face as many as 630,000 cases per day. Uh, that I don't know how credible that estimate is, but I think it speaks to Beijing's thinking about the risks. and. They look at the trade. I, I referred to robust trade relationships and investment. I mean, despite the disruptions to business from the travel restrictions, we see that China's exports have been incredibly strong throughout the pandemic. We see that the foreign investment inflows into China remain strong. So I don't think the leadership is blind to the cost, but I think on balance, especially given, uh, I mean, what we can't have and what they won't tolerate would be some kind of big outbreak just ahead of the party Congress or just ahead of the Winter Olympics in February. So I think on balance, they're, they're willing to accept the disruptions from uh, zero COVID because uh, the, uh, the alternative is worse. So speaking of COVID, I want to turn to, uh, I want to, turn to Africa now. Thanks, Gabe, and to our, my colleague, Anna Fruhau, who leads our Africa coverage. Uh, obviously, Omicron um, uh, sort of was first detected in, in Southern Africa, Botswana, I believe, and very quickly after it was uh, established, um, you know, travel restrictions were imposed uh, sort of from around the uh, around the world um, and seen as unfairly by many in southern Africa for their for their good sort of um, uh, their, their good virus detection system that they were penalized for uh, telling the world about this. Um, talk, talk about how this is playing out and what this what the implications are on it for the recovery prospects in 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 Africa now as you see it. Yes, absolutely. I mean, COVID is one of the major downsides for uh, uh, Africa's recovery prospects uh, going into the new year. Um, Omicron, I think, is really, really hits home that um, uh, of the urgent need for uh, global vaccine equity, right? We're talking about a region where um, 
uh, with the lowest global vaccination rate, uh, with just 10% of the population um, fully or partially vaccinated. And within that, you have huge gaps between the likes of Nigeria with about 3% and South Africa well over 30% and effectively having uh, uh, resolved its supply issue, right? So the, the impact for, um, for uh, the region um, cannot be overstated. Um, and the impact for uh, the recovery prospects going into the next year. If you think about it, you know, um, the region is expected to trail all other world regions, even Europe, which is very unusual in uh, 2021 and 2022. And so um, Africa, like many other parts of the world, does have an election cycle uh, each and every year. What are, we, what are the big ones to anticipate this year, uh, both in terms of the actual elections and then leading up uh, in, into, the, into the following year? Yes, yeah, so we have uh, the three largest economy in the region heading into uh, tumultuous election cycles of one sort or another. Uh, we have Kenya, uh, which is preparing for a transition post uh, two terms of uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, and that's traditionally a fraud process. There's a disruptive political violence that has, you know, that has real implications for uh, the Kenyan economy usually and tends to knock off a couple of percentage points of uh, of growth in any given in any election year, so this is a big problem, particularly in the context of rising debt. Um, then we have, I would like to highlight South Africa, which doesn't have elections due formally, but it is heading into the ANC uh, internal elective conference in the, at the end of um, uh, 2022, uh, and of course that will effectively decide whether Cyril Ramaphosa will be a two-term president. Um, and then finally, um, Nigeria um, has, doesn't have elections due until February 2023, but that means that effectively next year will be uh, the pre-election year and everything will be uh, dominating, um, elections will be dominating the political agenda uh, with the APC and the PDP uh, trying to um, determine the race of who will succeed Buhari. So stepping away for just a second from democratic transition, let's talk about, I mean, there's been considerable degree of instability in a number of countries in, uh, in West Africa in particular um, that are critical um, to the sort of the energy transition um, and, and for mining and minerals and, and, and whatnot. Uh, to, but talk about that political instability. Do you see that continuing? Obviously, Ethiopia and, um, and, and Sudan are very much in the news on both of these fronts right now. But what do you, what do you see on that, on that score? Yeah, so my colleagues and I, we call it a, a new arc of instability uh, emerging from uh, west to east across the Sahel, effectively. And I think what it's really teaching us that is security is returning as a macro level issue and a direct threat to political stability in a way we hadn't seen for probably the past two decades, really. Um, uh, so we have, we have had six coups um, in the course of this, over the course of this year, and we have the civil war in Ethiopia that could throw the entire region into turmoil. Um, we have, um, you know, we had the uh, UN Secretary General saying, coups are back in a big way, right? Um, from Mali to Guinea, and of course, um, you have, um, uh, that, that is fueling all sorts of issues, right? From destabilizing neighboring states, to fueling uh, transnational terrorism and uh, shifting uh, geopolitical alignments, particularly at a time when you have, for example, uh, bauxite producers like Guinea becoming ever more strategic plays in the context of the green uh, transition. So I want to unpack that last statement just a little bit. So I think it's fair to say we would all acknowledge that uh, the 20th century and early 21st century uh, a lot of the, a lot of geopolitics was defined uh, by the quest for and the security of oil. Um, and as we look at the energy transition, um, there are going to be different minerals uh, that are going to be uh, of, of critical importance, from lithium to cobalt to nickel to copper, um, and the list goes on, the rare earth metals and the like. And for all of that, the oil was actually pretty well dispersed around the world. And a lot of these other metals and mineral, minerals are very, very concentrated. Lithium, very concentrated, obviously, in Latin America and Australia. Cobalt, all you think about is the DRC, of course. So how do you see this impacting the geopolitics? Um, and talk a little bit about the dynamic as China and the United States and other markets try to secure supply out of some very, as you just put it, unstable places. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, exactly. I think, I mean, it'll sharpen geopolitical competition between the US, China, and also the EU in the race for economic and te technological dominance uh, over the coming years. And um, uh, clearly, we we uh, we are seeing, as you as you've highlighted, the DRC is the, the main strategic play in in terms of cobalt. But we also have producers of bauxite like Guinea. We have manganese and nickel in South, uh, South Africa. We have copper producers, right? So all of these, um, uh, many of these countries have high levels of state fragility and corruption. Um, and so what you will probably be seeing is that. Um, the proliferation of green um, energy technologies could drive conflict and a host of ESG risks, um, supply chain and compliance risks. Um, because remember, what's really green about these green minerals is not is their application, not their extraction process. Right. Exactly. So, well, thank you. I want it, to. It's a it's a perfect segue into you know where. The, where oil was sort of dominated the geopolitics, and, and, and that brings up the Middle East. So I want to turn now to, to John Alterman. He's a senior advisor to the firm, and he um, uh, leads our Middle East coverage. So, so John, um, you know, as, as Africa and other parts of the world that have these concentrations of these minerals um, become, you know, into the geopolitical focus, how does that energy transition going to play out um, in the middle in the Middle East, um, and, and especially in the coming year as this really starts to get underway? Well, I think very unevenly. First, I want to thank Anna for for giving a presentation on Africa that makes the Middle East seem like a a, a center of stability for the world. Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting shift. I think what we're really seeing over the next several years is this increased volatility in oil markets and countries trying to figure out what does that mean strategically for them. I mean, on Friday, oil prices went down 10% when they, they announced that they had found this Omicron variant, and then they went up 5% on Monday. Countries, national oil companies are trying to make big decisions about investments and exploration and production over time. The, the whole ESG sector is affecting the amount of money that's available to companies to invest in exploration, what the energy transition looks like over time, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, what they should do now. It wouldn't surprise me if we have a period of higher oil prices that then drive people to do more uh, uh, creativity invention on the green side, which then depresses the demand for oil, so oil prices go down, and then there's a shortage in, in uh, exploration and production, oil prices go up. I think we may see a tremendously cyclical market. And for governments in the region, on the one hand, that's a reminder that they have to diversify their economies and they have to, to, to get people off the expectation that they're government employees and, and create a genuine private sector that's competitive, all those kinds of things. And when the oil prices go up, it means you can ease that transition a little bit. But I think planning becomes tremendously difficult and setting expectations for the population becomes tremendously difficult in this really, really volatile economic environment. And the Middle East is on the tail end, both for the energy producers and for the labor producers that send labor to work in the, com in the countries that are energy producers. So really the whole Middle East gets tied to what's happening to, to global oil prices. So let me so let's put aside for one second the Iran nuclear negotiations. I want to get to that in a in a moment more specifically. But you know, there's been there's an there's an evolution obviously in in US policy toward the region. Part of that is just dictated by its, you know, uh singular attention uh on 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 China in terms of foreign affairs and the like. So how does the changing US footprint impact, you know, um within the context that you've just laid out? You know, how is that going to impact the stability uh, of the region? What are the more, what are the, some of the other trends you see on that front? Obviously, in the last few years, you know, the Abraham Accords, some of the rapprochement in terms of uh, dealings between Israel and some of the Arab states has been a big thing. Obviously, the conflicts in places like Syria and Yemen continue to uh, continue to play out in their own way. How do you see the the stability of the region over the next, you know, 12 months? Um... Well, I think the stability of the region is going to, to really have a lot to do with Iran, and we can talk about that in a second. I was at the UAE National Day last night at the Kennedy Center. I spoke to a lot of very senior administration officials. 
they're pretty dark about where things are going to go with Iran over the next six to nine months and what that's going to mean for the region. But more broadly, they've been going around, they've been saying, look, we are right-sizing our ambitions in the Middle East to match the resources we have to meet those ambitions. That from the Bush administration, you know, going, we're going to transform Iraq and we're going to make the Middle East do a bunch of liberal democracies and all those kinds of things. There was a sense that the U.S. was promising things that it never had the hope of delivering and was way out of position. Uh, the Trump administration, on the one hand, had a maximum pressure campaign against Iran. On the other hand, said we're going to withdraw from the Middle East. And so I think what, what they're saying is we are going to have a much more modest footprint in the region. What countries interpret from that is the U.S. is on its way out the door, that countries have to diversify their relationships, that they want a China relationship to supplement but not supplant the U.S. relationship. They are looking at a Russia relationship narrower but one that fits some needs. They're looking to see if they can supplement with other European countries. Is there a relationship with India that can play some useful role? But I think for a lot of these countries, you know, by the late Clinton administration, every country in the Middle East either had a positive relationship with the United States or wanted a positive relationship with the United States. And the U.S. was really at the center. And the U.S. is sending a message to countries, do not put us at your center. And I think there's not a full appreciation of the kinds of things countries are going to do as they hedge their bets on the U.S. Uh, we just had this case a couple of weeks ago, I think, uh, that the, the Chinese turned out to be building a facility at a UAE port that the Americans were concerned had a, 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 an intelligence or military uh, intent associated with it. I, a lot of countries are saying, so... If you're going to be totally with us, be totally with us. If you're not going to be with us, don't complain when we diversify our relationships. And they're unsure, and a number of countries are also getting concerned about getting caught in a fight between the U.S. and China uh, with a sense of, of, please let us know the specific boundaries and we won't cross them. The Chinese are very good at, at uh, laying down specific boundaries. A lot of it has to do with treatment of the Uyghurs and other kinds of things. Uh, the U.S. is less good at it. And um, as people on the recipient side are, are getting a little bit grumpy about it, but I think they're going to have to deal with it. So let's turn then to the Iran situation, because, um, you know, obviously you've had new, uh, a new administration in both Iran and in the United States. So new interlocutors, though not necessarily the positions changing very much. So uh, well, and arguably the whole U.S. team, arguably the whole U.S. team is the team that negotiated the Iran deal. Uh, under the Obama in administration, the first place. So yeah, yeah, right, exactly, exactly, and then and then when we pulled out of the um, uh, pulled out of the JCPOA, it was a different crew running the story. Now, now we're back in. But what do you? I mean, it, it sounded like quite pessimistic what you're hearing from administration insiders. But um, what do you what do you see? Um, is there any is there anything positive coming out of uh, uh, coming out of these meetings in Vienna anytime soon? I don't think anytime soon at all. In the longer term, maybe. I think it's a it's a hard bet to make. Uh, as you know, I wrote a Panera brief uh, a few days ago that, that argued that I think the Iranians are looking for brinkmanship. Um, they think that the previous team left everything on the table. They never got what they were promised from the Obama team. It was all taken away by the Trump team. They had absolutely nothing to show for their efforts that what they are going to do, I think, is both accelerate the enrichment piece and potentially do some other things with their, you know, asymmetric threats, the ones that are hard to attribute, whether it's involving proxies in other countries in the Middle East, whether it's, you know, ships that go boom in the middle of the night, whether it's drone attacks, those kinds of things. I think the Iranians are going to try to create a sense of crisis among other countries, including the United States, with a bet that if they can create that crisis, countries will rush to make a deal with them on their terms, and they'll be better off. There are two things that's counting on. One is that the U.S. can't really tighten the screws more. Uh, I think when I spoke to senior officials, including last night, 
Um, they, they feel there are ways for them to tighten the screws, but you know, I think the Iranians look and say the Trump administration said this is a maximum pressure campaign. The Trump administration was trying to overthrow the government of the Islamic Republic, and it got nowhere. So what are we afraid of? So I'm not sure they're they're concerned about that. I think the other thing that 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 people have to wonder about is do the Israelis have any capabilities? Does the Israeli agreement with the UAE give them capabilities? they didn't have before, does the sort of wink, wink, nod, nod between the Saudis and the Israelis. It's not a visible relationship. There are invisible relationships that are strengthening. Does that give them anything in terms of overflight, refueling, whatever? Uh, I think that there's a sense the Israelis may have more cards to play. And that's where the brinkmanship comes in. You sort of have a three-way dance going on. I have to tell you, last night, the UA National Day, I saw an awful lot of Israelis an awful lot of Israelis. Uh, and that is a very interesting relationship. And I think it's one we need to watch, not out of concern, but I think a lot of assumptions we've made about the Middle East and about security and about even economic ties uh, may, be, may be out the window because this is something the Israelis are really, really serious about and something the Emiratis are extraordinarily serious about. And so far, you know, in the first, the first year, it has much more traction than I thought it could. Great. Well, well, thanks, John. I want to I want to turn to Europe now. Um, but before I do, sort of between the Middle East and Europe sits Turkey, of course, and um, Turkey is increasingly concerning to to markets, uh, as uh, I think you know the the sort of um, policy making becomes increasingly erratic uh, er erratic there. Um, and, and particularly alarming, um, considering its geopolitical position, uh, its membership in NATO, et cetera. But Antonio Baforoso is with us today. He, uh, he's one of our leaders of our, of our European coverage, um, works closely with Wolf Pikoli, who, who leads our Turkey coverage for us. But Antonio, what, what are you seeing on, and, and what is Wolf seeing on Turkey at the moment? Sure. What we're seeing is that there's a lot of noise regarding uh, 2022 and the possibility of an election, uh, because the assumption is that uh, Erdogan is facing so many problems uh, that, uh, you know, before things get worse, uh, it will be better for him to call uh, snap poll. However, the view of the team is that uh, he has no incentive to do so. He will continue to manipulate the economy uh, in an effort to essentially try to be in a stronger position in 2023. Also, it will be important to notice uh, um, on, and, and from a point of view of the opposition is that uh, the opposition has no way to trigger a snap poll. So, but all the noise that you might have about uh, um, a, a potential election in 2022, we don't see it. Uh, that doesn't mean that there won't be a continued economic turmoil. We saw this morning with the replacement of the finance minister. We think that's the situation that Erdogan finds itself uh, in and is going to continue being the default situation for the foreseeable future. So um, in Europe itself, um, I want to get in a moment to, uh, you know, what, where we're going to evolve to in a post uh, Angela Merkel environment. But one of the things that's going to be a determining factor of that is going to be the outcome of, of the major election in Europe this year, which is the French election. So maybe let, let's just start with your your expectations on, on, the, on the French election itself and any other elections in Europe you want to comment on this year. But let, what, what, how do you see that, that playing out next spring? Sure, Kevin. I think, look, um, let, let's start with the caveats. Uh, this time, uh, in 2016, right before the 2017 election, François Fillon was supposed to be the front runner. One month later, uh, a scandal emerged affecting him, and then Emmanuel Macron ended up getting the victory, right? So, you know, things are very fluid. Uh, there's a lot of electoral volatility uh, in the uh, in French elections of lately, so let's just put that there. That being said, we believe that this is uh, incumbent President Emmanuel Macron's election to lose is uh, essentially leading all opinion polls. So the true question is who's going to be facing him in the second round. The election is taking place in April, and you have a first round on the 10th of April, and a second round in the 24th of April. And at this point, we see Marine Le Pen as the best place to essentially face him again in a second round. Um, we still believe Macron will defeat Marine Le Pen because she's still perceived as too radical to win the overall contest, even though probably the margin of victory of Macron will be uh, narrower than, than in 2017. Um, another possibility is that you have a candidate from uh, the Republicans party, it's a center-right party, the party of former President Nicolas Sarkozy. Interestingly, as we are having this uh, conference call, um, 
the first round of the primary election of the Republicans just took place, and you have former budget minister Valérie Pérez and a party stalwart, uh, Eric Chiotti, going to the second round. Um, if Pérez wins the contest on Saturday, that might be an interesting challenger for Macron. Uh, we still think that Macron, uh, given that he will receive some of the uh, of the uh, votes of, of, of left-wing uh, part of the spectrum, will be in a situation to defeat Pérez, but Pérez will be an interesting uh, challenge for Macron. And the third possibility is that you have the, the far-right polemist that has emerged from nowhere, um, Eric Semour, who is a very controversial figure, uh, very radical, uh, and who has suddenly emerged in the polls um, in recent weeks. However, his momentum has stalled, so the possibility that he might go to the second round uh, seems to be uh, declining. And in any case, Macron, I think, will post a strong victory in that case. So, assuming that uh, you have these scenarios, I'm just going to cover two of them to see the potential outcome. Um, one that our clients ask us about a lot is what happens if Le Pen wins? What happens uh, to Europe? And I don't think Le Pen will call a referendum on, on Brexit or anything like that, which is what people were fretting about in 2017. But make no mistake, if she wins, it will be mayhem for Europe because she can make things very difficult for European integration. For example, not, up, not applying certain decisions taken in Brussels, by blocking decisions, by asking to renegotiate certain competences. So it will be definitely a problem for Europe. If you have a figure for the center right winning, I think it will be business as usual, maybe some noise on the migration front, but you know, if we were to be precarious, it will be quite, uh, you know, business as usual in terms of defending French interests, but in favor of European integration and so on. And to, to conclude with the main scenario, let's say Macron wins. Now what you will have is uh, in France, in, in Paris and in Berlin, two of the most pro-European governments you have ever had uh, in the history of European integration. And that's crucial, right? Because we know that the Franco-German engine is the one that pushes for European integration. So we think that in the medium term, that can only be positive for Europe, for strengthening Europe from an institutional economic standpoint. But France is France, Germany is Germany, meaning they still disagree about a lot of things, right? And so, for example, uh, fiscal rules are now currently suspended in Europe, and they're supposed to um, basically get implemented again from 2023 onwards. And there is currently a debate about reforming them. And Paris and Berlin have different views of how to do it. So that's going to be a tough discussion. You might have some kind of agreement towards the end of next year. But just to remind everybody, the fact that you have two very pro-European governments in uh, Paris and Berlin doesn't mean that you will immediately have a leap towards more European integration. So uh, you brought up Germany here. Uh, obviously, after 16 years, imminent uh, departure of, uh, of Angela Merkel. Um, and not only is she leaving as the most popular politician in Germany, she is leaving as the most respected politician in the world. Um, and, you know, assume for and, and, and Schultz, her successor uh, in the chancellery is, uh, is, is well known, obviously, in political circles and diplomatic circles, but obviously doesn't have the global stature that she does. Assume for a moment that your uh, Le Pen scenario does not play out, that, uh, that Macron is, 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 is reelected. And while he has had global stage ambitions, he also doesn't really have the stature that Merkel does. So talk about Europe position in the, in the world in a, in a post-Merkel uh, uh, en environment, um, you know, uh, is there a vacuum of, of, of leadership there? And does that have any implications um, uh, for, for European position economically, strategically, et cetera, uh, and in the sort of, in, in, in the cross-current, crossfire of the, of the China-U.S. relationship? Sure. I don't think you will have a vacuum of leadership. If anything, you might have too much leadership with uh, Scholz that is trying to reassert himself as uh, you know, the, one of the leading figures uh, in, in Europe, and Macron, that if he gets re-election, he will only you know, push more strongly in favor of things such as economic sovereignty, technological sovereignty, things that he really feels strong about. But look, at the end of the day, the, po the, the problem for Europe is structural in the sense that there is truly among policymakers the realization that you need to have a more coherent and strong common position on certain things, such as China but you still have divergent opinions on certain issues, right? And let's go to, to China for a second. I, I like what, what uh, um, Gabe mentioned, the new normal of US and, Europe, uh, and, and China relations, sorry. And my sense is that Europe and China are still trying to find what the new normal of the relationship between the two of them is. 
in the sense that, you know, at the same time last year, you had Angela Merkel, uh, Emmanuel Macron, and the European Commission pushing for the uh, um, concluding of the comprehensive agreement on investment between the EU and China. Now that's in the freezer because of uh, sanctions that uh, Europe imposed on China and the counter sanctions that, that China imposed. Uh, now you have in Germany uh, a green minister in charge of trade, which makes everything more difficult because the Greens have been traditionally quite quite uh, aggressive on the issue of, of, of human rights. They give it a lot of importance, both in uh, Germany and in the European Parliament. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, Germany is still an export dependent country, right? And, and these are leaders that know that they cannot go all the way aggressive on China. And I think on that front, I think my assessment is that um, what both sides are going to be looking for is maybe trying not to regress in that relationship. I don't see any strong wins that you can make in terms of bilateral agreements or anything like that, because you have a structural trends that are taking place that make that very difficult. For example, the EU is supposed to pass a supply chain due diligence law, uh, propose it and then negotiate it in the coming months, which uh, you know will basically impose obligations on firms to monitor uh, uh, human rights issues in these supply chains. That can create some tensions with China. The EU is also developing uh, uh, what they are called autonomous instruments against unfair trade practices. They don't mention China, but practically they are basically targeted towards China. And, you know, if you want any kind of improvement for CAI, for the Comprehensive Agreement on, Bis on Investment to be approved, you will have to see some move on China, uh, some detente, uh, lifting the sanctions, but also uh, some kind of uh, movement rapprochement towards uh, the EU for things to basically be unfrozen. And that doesn't seem to be on the horizon, right? So I think what you can expect is, uh, you know, from time to time, there might be some rhetorical tensions. Uh, but I think the objective is non-regression to make sure that you keep uh, trading uh, and that things don't get worse between the two sides. You know, before we leave Europe, I want to I want to touch base on, on on Russia here for just a moment. Um, obviously, uh, there's great concern um, in the international community about uh, Russian troop movements along Ukraine. Uh, again, I mean, clearly. Putin retains his ability to be incredibly disruptive in um, in global politics and has always operated along this sort of, you know, keep pushing until you feel steel. And he just always feels mush, essentially. And so, you know, he pursues his revanchist policies. Um, what what are our what are our what are we really watching here on the uh, on the Russia front at this time? Well, I think one of the main hot points, as uh, everybody knows, is Ukraine and there's uh, the constant concern about whether Russia will proceed with a military incursion in Ukraine that might make things worse. Um, uh, our our view, the view of our team, is that 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 action will carry more risks than opportunities because uh, you will see media sanctions from the EU and the US, and that's something that Putin doesn't seem to want. Now that doesn't mean that uh, Putin is not is not continue will not continue creating chaos because he is very comfortable with chaos and he knows that Europeans are not comfortable with instability and with conflict, right? Uh, so probably what we will see is Putin continue to, uh, um, uh, well, or rather than Putin, Russia, uh, continue to basically be a pain in the neck of the Europeans through all these different actions at the border with Belarus and so on, trying to put pressure on the Europeans and also the U.S. to make sure that, you know, that uh, they don't uh, support very strongly Ukraine, that you, you know, has the objective of making sure that you guarantee that uh, Ukraine will never uh, join NATO and so on and so forth. But, you know, the view of our team is that at the end of the day, you should never see an end goal in Putin's actions. He's comfortable with chaos. He derives benefits from that. So we should assume that that should be the default situation going forward in the next 12 months. Great. Thank you. Let's spin the globe here a little bit further and move on to Latin America. <clears throat> Nicholas Watson uh, leads our Latin American coverage and he's with us today. The big election in the region um, next year, obviously, is Brazil. So what are our expectations on, um, on that front, Nicholas? Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess it's, first of all, just worth mentioning that the elections don't take place until October, which leaves plenty of time for, for campaign twists and turns uh, between now and then. Um, but I think that the, the essential electoral equation is a highly polarized contest between left, as represented by Lula, and right in the shape of Bolsonaro. There are a few, several centrists who insert themselves uh, into, into the contest. The most notable is the, uh, 
the former judge and justice minister Sergio Moro. But it looks like an uphill battle for any of these centrists to make it into the run. Uh, I think Bolsonaro's got some real challenges this time around. Uh, the economic outlook doesn't look particularly bright for Brazil in 2022. Um, the economy is unlikely to grow much more than 1%. Some are already forecasting a recession, a mild recession. Inflation is up to double digits, highest levels in 20 years. Um, Bolsonaro also, you know, he obviously faces the Lula challenge, but um, he'll also uh, be under attack from, from all of these centrists led by Moro. And then finally, I think it's very difficult for Bolsonaro to present himself this time around as, as the, the anti-corruption champion, you know, given that his, his politician's sons are, are under investigation for corruption. And he's just joined a, uh, one of the kind of big center opportunistic corruption tainted parties himself. Um, having said that, I don't think we can rule him out of contention. Um, Lula is a, still a divisive figure in Brazil. There's a lot of anti-PT sentiment. And of course, um, perhaps more importantly, Bolsonaro is also going to be making use of this, this revamp cash transfer program that, that hugely boosted his approval ratings earlier on in the pandemic. Uh, and then just finally, I, I suppose I, 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 I think it's also worth just saying it, it will be a bumpy ride ahead for Brazil. Uh, some of the rhetoric that Bolsonaro has, has come up with is, is, is extreme. You know, he said he sees three alternatives for his future in 2022, being arrested, being killed or victory. And he said he will never be arrested. So that just leaves death or victory. I think we can, you know, put that down to some Bolsonaro bravado. Um, and there's no indication that the military would be prepared to, to follow him blindly in, in some kind of extra constitutional adventure. But I think that that kind of rhetoric and the fact that Bolsonaro has been prepared to, to mobilize his hardcore supporters on the streets means that, you know, we're in for a bumpy ride ahead in Brazil. So, you know, we had uh, clearly we had a number of elections in 2021 in uh, in Spanish speaking Latin America and certain trends kind of uh, presented themselves. Um, how, how do you see that carrying on into into 2022 and, and, and beyond? I mean, analytically, are you are you uh, what are you discerning on that front? I think anti incumbency is, is the one big trend that we can see much more than the uh, the old pink tide kind of theory of left leaning uh, and, and, and swings in, in the cycle. Um, you know, this year we, we saw uh, Peru, Ecuador, Chile, Argentina, even Honduras last weekend all swinging against the incumbents. And I think that the, the, the same might be true of Brazil, as we've just been talking about, um, and also in the case of Colombia, where Gustavo Petro, yes, he's a leftist, but I think his his chief value going into this election, which takes place over, over May and June, is that he's something different, that he can offer something different. And governments have struggled with, with COVID across the region. Um, there's a real economic dissatisfaction. And in fact, that predates the pandemic. Uh, it's important to add in a number of countries. Um, and government's just not delivering in ways that, that citizens want. And I know that, um... You know, there's some other, there are some other, not elections, but there are other, there are other votes that are potentially pending out there in both Mexico and Chile, let's say, um, that may be underappreciated because they're not seen as elections, but, but could have import, um, to, to investors and corporate, uh, investors alike. What, what's going on on that front? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mexico should hold a, a presidential recall referendum which is being organized at the behest of the president himself. This isn't some citizen movement trying to oust the president. This is the president wanting it himself. Um, they're uh, doing a signature uh, collection drive at the moment. So it's not absolutely set in stone that it will happen. We should know by the end of the month. Um, if it takes place, it would be probably in April. Um, and really the idea is for, for uh, but behind it is for President Andres Manuel López Obrador, AMLO, as he's known, um, really to kind of reboot his presidency. It's a six-year presidency, single term. Six years is a long time in Mexican politics. Um, he's halfway through, exactly. 
Um, so he wants to give himself new, fresh momentum for the second half, control the succession, um, paper over divisions within his um, often divided uh, Morena party, um, and, and basically maintain his authority and keep the opposition divided. That, that's the purpose of, of the Mexican referendum. Um, moving to Chile, um, the country's obviously been going through a, a process of, of uh, constitutional change, and as part of that, a constituent assembly is sitting, has been in session since July. And the arrangement was that when the constituent assembly finishes its work, there'll be a, an exit referendum to either endorse or reject the new document that the constituent assembly comes up with. So in theory, that should happen in August or September. But what makes it so uncertain is that we're in a parallel electoral process, which is the presidential election. Chile has unfinished business even in 2021 because we've got the second round coming up on the 19th of December. And that is another highly polarized contest between right, the, in the shape of José Antonio Cast, and the left, a new kind of younger, more radical populist left, uh, represented by Gabriel Boric. And um, it's very difficult to say which way that's going to go. And it's obviously a, a really binary choice going in two quite different directions. But the fact that the Constituent Assembly is also sitting makes this very, very uncertain. Uh, for the country. For example, if the leftist wins that is blocked in Congress, as it looks like he would be, might he try and insert some of his proposals into the Constitution? What kind of reaction would that have? If the right winger wins, will he campaign against the new Constitution? In which case, the, the question arises, well, if the new constitution is rejected. Does that set off new rounds of, of unrest of the type that we saw in 2019? So a lot of uncertainty for Chile. So before we leave Latin America, one last question for you, which is that institutional investors are perennially concerned uh, with Argentina and its negotiations with the IMF. So wh what, what to expect on that front? Yeah, I mean, as ever, it's the big question facing Argentina. Um, the government has been chalking up its chances of reaching a deal soon, possibly before the end of this year. I think that reflects the fact that they've got a big payment, almost 1.9 billion, that's due on the 22nd of December. They would quite like a, an early Christmas gift of, of maybe not having to, to make that payment. Um, I think, realistically, the, the talks are likely to, to, to stretch on into early 2022. There is a, a finance ministry team going to Washington, D.C. this coming weekend. So we should get, I expect, some fine tuning of, of figures that will go into a medium term economic plan, which the government has said it will send to Congress in, in December. That plan is a prerequisite for any deal. So plan first and, and then there'll be some more talks, I expect. Um, but the pressure's on. $19 billion Argentina needs to pay to the IMF over 2022. That's unpayable. They have less than $5 billion in net reserves currently. Um, and it's not budgeted either. Um, so the budget for 2022 is predicated on an agreement being reached. I think the best case scenario is some kind of soft or very light deal uh, that's reached before March. Uh, everything needs to be settled by March because there are some big payments due, both to the fund and the Paris Club. Worst case scenario, Argentina goes into arrears with the IMF. Got it. Um, thank you. And um... We started with Asia. We're going to end with Asia today. And, and uh, my longtime colleague, Bob Herrera Lim, is on the line. And, and first of all, I just want to say I appreciate you joining us so late in the night uh, from Manila, Bob. But um, we've been talking about a lot of elections in various regions of the world. Uh, there are elections upcoming in non-China Asia as well. So tell us, uh, tell us about the dynamic going into next year. Okay, Kevin, thank you. So, you know, uh, Southeast Asia reminds me of those old science fiction movies, right, where there are lots of lights flashing, lots of buttons that are going to be pushed this year, and you're wondering what's going to happen next. There are three overlays to this. First is the U.S., right? The, the elections in South Korea will affect how that country uh, manages its relations, not only with the U.S., but with the Quad and with China and Japan. And you have the Democratic Party, which favors a more peninsular outlook, 
basically concerned with a more inward looking foreign policy. And then you have the PPP, the conservatives, who are more looking towards the traditional security relationships, uh, having relationships with the Quad, uh, uh, offering an olive branch to basically Japan and taking a firmer line towards Pyongyang. So that will affect how the region shapes up economically. That's the first thing. The second thing is uh, you will have elections as well in the Philippines and in, uh, in, in the Philippines as well. That's the second election that's scheduled for South for Asia. Now, the challenge for the Philippines is the leader is the leading candidate is Marcos, the son of the former autocrat. Now, that has a lot of baggage for the United States because for a decade or so, uh, the U.S. was the prime patron of Marcos with all the uh, uh, military supplies and aid. But then Dick Luger called in 1986 and said it's time to cut and cut cleanly. And you don't know which part of the Marcos family or which side the Marcos family sees. You know, the U.S. is, a, is a, a somebody that helped their father or a country that abandoned their father. So and for any U.S. president, it's going to be uncomfortable standing on the same platform as the Marcos says. But then you have this question, the Philippines is critical to, shall we say, defining security, at least in Southeast Asia, to some of the longest standing security relationships with, uh, with the United States. It is on the porch of the flashpoint that is, out, that is the South China Sea. So how the elections in the Philippines turn out could as well affect regional security happen, and what happens with that. Now, there are two other elections that might or might not be happening. We think they'll be happening, but they'll be less consequential regionally because for, for two reasons. The first is uh, these are going to be weak coalition governments, so they're going to be focused on their domestic politics and how to manage their domestic economies. And that's in Thailand and Malaysia. It weakens the probability of domestic reform, but it doesn't affect regional geopolitics as much. Now, there are other transi transitions we could be watching. In Cambodia, Han Sen just announced that his son, Han Manet, destined to succeed him. Han Manet is a graduate of West Point and the University of Bristol. He will be much more acceptable to Western observers compared to his father, you know, with the Khmer Rouge uh, uh, ties. So these are all things that could be affecting how the U.S. approaches Southeast Asia. And obviously, you have the effects of the elections of Japan and the effects on how Japan will try to increase its economic security towards uh, China in terms of supply chain. So it's going to be a very, very complicated picture. And we're not even talking about what's in Myanmar yet. Well, um, you brought up Myanmar. So why don't we, why don't you, you talk a bit about that? I mean, it's basically, um, you know, sort of teetering on failed state status in a, in a, in a sense, but where, where, where do you see that going? Okay, so you, you basically have a, a junta that, they, that was voted out of office and is unpopular with the overwhelming part of the population. The challenge is 20 years ago, this would have been a scenario where basically because of the lack of internet, because of the lack of organization, people have said, so you know, it's, it's like, who can challenge the generals? But right now people are even, you know, months after the coup emboldened, basically resist the generals. If you take a look in the streets of Yangon or any of the cities, there are sandbags around government offices there are sandbags around police outposts because they are that worried. And you know, the question is, is Myanmar right now in civil war? And the, and the interesting thing about this is Myanmar is also a, shall we say, a chessboard game. It's part of the chessboard game, right? Uh, the, 10 years ago, people were so optimistic that it could become the next frontier economy following after Vietnam. So you had ADB, you had World Bank, all the Western institutions filing in, hoping that the country becomes the next Vietnam. But now, you know, does it go back? Does it go to China? Does Russia try to play a role as a patron state? As a patron state, and then do you have India with its own interests in Myanmar? So this is another, you know, point where the geopolitics of the region could also become enmeshed. So it was my job to land the plane on time. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, fail to do that um, because I, I'm hoping everybody will indulge me with just a couple more questions uh, for for Bob here. But Bob, one thing is on the COVID front, uh, COVID policy front. Obviously, um, just thinking about the resiliency of the uh, of the region and the policies that are in place, the vaccine policies and the like. 
Um, you know, a lot of these countries are highly tourism dependent, but I also want to talk about the supply chain dependency. I mean, we've seen the impact on places like Vietnam and, and whatnot after, after going through COVID and getting away, you know, relatively unscathed until Delta hit and then, and then things got very, very bad and that had, uh, that had supply chain implications. Um, how do you see uh, COVID playing out in the, in the, in the region uh, as we head into year, year three? Well, the hope among many governments is that the vaccines work. Okay, Va vaccine hesitation is not an issue in Southeast Asia. If you tell Southeast Asia six months from now you need your fifth jab because of the last letter of the Greek alphabet being used up, they will line up for that jab and they will ask for another jab if needed be. Okay, because that's what people would like because they would like to get on with their lives. So, you, you know, and like in the Philippines, when this started, vaccine hesitancy was around 60%, now down to 30%. It's a challenge of getting more of the infrastructure, syringes, cold chain established in countries like Indonesia and in, in, in the Philippines. But in terms of vaccine hesitation, it's, it's going down significantly in the region, which is good news for supply chains. The, the challenge really is uh, that because of the integration of the region, in terms of people flows, in terms of goods flows, uh, you know, moving away from the COVID, the challenge has been moving people's mentality away from the COVID, so we say, zero policy. And the second is building their confidence in healthcare, that they can get sick. If they can get sick, they will be treated at a reasonable cost. That is something that's available in most Western countries. It's not available in many of the larger countries. So the, the, the challenge with COVID is not really the vaccine hesitation. It's getting the healthcare system in place so that people will become more confident that if they get sick, they can still, you know, be treated at a decent price, go back to work, and be able to do their jobs, which is what it did not happen in Vietnam. That's why we've had disruptions in Vietnam over the past three months. My last question on this front is, is on, on, on the Asia front, is that obviously we've talked a lot about, um, you know, and, and this is, I know it's sort of sloppy shorthand, and we can debate the use of the term, but this Cold War that is, that is emerging between the United States uh, and China. Um, a lot of this is going to play out in the neighborhood. Um, the most dramatic news we saw of the past uh, of this past year was the nuclear submarine deal between the United States and, and the UK and, and Australia. Um, but we have, you know, we've seen China continuing to militarize uh, and make uh, and make um, uh, territorial claims in the South and East China Seas. They're building up their Blue Water Navy, etc. How more, much more challenging over the course of this year is it going to be for all of these countries from Australia to the Philippines and, you know, and, um, and Indonesia and Malaysia and all the rest to kind of thread the needle um, between the security and economic realities um, that, uh, that exist between the United States and China? Okay, that's going to be the big challenge because the U.S. is coming in. It's actually done better than many people expected, right? Uh, Biden attended the summit, and then you had you have, had Blinken, Austin, all going through, and even Vice President Kamala Harris all coming through. So the even S Southeast Asia itself is seeing the U.S. as you know a little bit more credible than in the past. Now, when this happens, then the countries in the region start to think of their own interest in terms of how do they define themselves with the big players, right? Southeast Asia is a price taker in terms of geopolitical risk. In terms of geopolitical positioning in the region. And what's going to happen next, I think, is that as these positions become much more clearer, the countries will try in Southeast Asia to have a much more unified voice, right? So you will have a new player, or not a new player, but a stronger player, which is ASEAN, emphasizing ASEAN centrality. So this is how I think they will try to thread the needle. Say, okay, we have to put ASEAN's interest at heart, which is trade, which is maintaining the balance between economics and politics, keeping goods flowing, accessing markets, all these things. And so your question is how the Southeast Asia thread is or now the East Asia thread is, it's through the idea of ASEAN centrality and basically saying, okay, we have to think about the things that matter to us because the, you know, the elephants are playing and we don't want to be the grass that gets trampled. So we have covered an awful lot of ground today. The price of that is, is that we only get to scratch the surface. But to suffice it to say, um, uh, my colleagues and I will be covering all of these issues over the, uh, over the course of the year to come. Uh, some of this we'll be covering on the Taneo Insights calls. But 
If you have any questions on any of these issues, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can uh, reach us at Taneo Insights at Taneo.com. Uh, I want to thank my, my colleagues. Um, finally today, since we launched Taneo Insights, um, uh, my colleague, Alexandra Lager, has, uh, whose voice you typically have heard at the beginning of this call, has been our behind the scenes producer. Today is her last day with us. Uh, I wanna thank her for all of her efforts and wish her luck in her next endeavors. Um, thanks, Al, uh, you've done a great job, really appreciate it. Um, everybody else, I hope you will join us uh, in two weeks time on, uh, on December the 16th, which will be our final call of the, uh, of the year. Uh, hope you can join us. Um, but until then, uh, I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York. Thanks so much for joining us today. And thanks uh, to my colleagues around the world. Have a great day.